everybody. Welcome to Telly Talks, where we talk about life, growth, relationships, and all things in between. I have my co-host, OGZ Too Funny. And today, we have a special guest who is a national best-selling author and transformational speaker, Poot Blackson. Good to be here. Thank you for coming. Thanks for having me. So for the people that don't know who you are, that live probably under a rock, can you tell us about yourself and your journey and how you got to where you Uh, are? I was born in Ghana, West Africa. My father's from Ghana, my mother's Japanese. I grew up in London, been living here for 20 some years. Uh, From a very young age, I always felt a deep calling to uh, serve people in some way. I felt a deep desire to make an impact in people's lives. One of my first memories as a young boy was literally seeing a crippled woman crawling on the floor. She picks up the sand that this man walks on, wipes it on her face and stands up. So talk about a miracle. So as a young boy, I grew up seeing blind people see and deaf people hear and people stand up out of wheelchairs. The same man whose sand she picked up would look at a woman in a wheelchair and say, why are you in this wheelchair? You're not sick, stand up. This man was my father. So my father built 300 churches in Ghana, West Africa, a huge church in London. And uh, I grew up in this environment, you know? And so age eight, I I started speaking in my father's churches. Uh, I was actually more interested in playing soccer than spirituality or religion. Uh, But my father threw me in front of the audience and said, speak. And that began my speaking career. Age 14, I was ordained as a minister. Oh, wow. wow. Uh, yeah, it's crazy. Wow. I was at given the mat. 14. Yeah. That's not not crazy. my path. That is amazing. Completely unexpected. I knew I wanted to help people, but one day my father just announces to the congregation, my son is taking over my organization. And I'm Ooh. like, what? I, at 14. I, at 14. And so. Uh, it ha- was your father like, older then? Yeah, like, no, my father was probably in his 60s. In oh, his he, was, he was still yeah. old to continue yeah. to do what he was yeah. doing, to yeah. continue to build his But I knew, I knew in that moment that this was not my path. I knew it wasn't my destiny. I felt a connection to God, but I wanted to do it in a different way. Uh, but the truth is, I was too afraid to speak my truth to my father. My fear was if I spoke my truth, I would be outcast, I'd be alone, I would lose his love. Mm. And so I went along with it. And uh, for four years, went through so much internal turmoil and questioning and soul searching. Uh, But at 18, I had to make a decision. Do I I take the expected path for my life and and, and just follow my father's footsteps, you know? And, And I looked into my future, age 20, age 30, age 40, and I saw that I could be successful by everyone else's standards, but if I don't have myself, if I don't have my soul, if I don't have my truth, what kind of success is that, you know? Absolutely. And then, but, but my soul was calling me in a whole different direction. I wanted to come to America. I became very obsessed as a young kid with spirituality and self-help and meditation. And as a young boy, I began to ask myself the question, you know, why are we here? What's the purpose of life? I grew up in a very poor environment, but I got a scholarship to a very uh, prestigious school. And a lot of my uh, schoolmates, their parents were uh, president's kids and politician's kids. So they had every reason to be happy, but were miserable. And my father's congregation had every reason to be miserable, but were happy. Right. And so for me, I started asking myself the questions. What's the purpose of life? Is it just to wake up, make money, go mm. to work, go on vacation, and then die? Like, surely there has to be more to this thing called life. Because what the what's happy? the answers to We life, don't take any baby. of it with us. Absolutely. And so I began the soul searching. So I read 800 books by the time I was 18. Sheesh. Wow. On a quest of just trying to figure life out. 800. 800, 800 self-help books. So this oh. became my passion. 800 self-help. Oh. So you did more than 800 books. Those are just 800 self-help books. Self-help books. Damn. You know, we're wow. talking you know, Tony Damn. Robbins, Deepak Chopra, all these motivational icons. That was icons. something within yourself because do you feel like that that happened that way because it's what your dad instilled in you? Or is that something that you found within yourself? Yeah, my father had all of these spiritual, you know, inspirational books on his bookshelf. So I would sneak into his library and start reading. And this, this part was internal for me. This part was my own uh, inspiration. Oh, yeah. So like, yeah. for instance, we lived behind my father's church. We didn't have a lot of money. So I would, and my bedroom was literally this size right here. So my dreams were so big, my reality was so small. I would sneak into my father's church in the middle of the night with the lights off, and I would give, we're talking age 12, I'd give seminars to the empty chairs, imagining people from around the world, imagining myself, you know, we were two, 3,000 people. So this was my dream, yeah. But, it, but I knew it wasn't through the church or religion. And so when I was 18, I had to make a decision. And it was really painful, I felt a deep conflict, you know. 
what I really realized is you cannot be truly fulfilled and happy being someone that you're not. Absolutely. You mm. cannot be truly fulfilled and happy, true. you know, living someone else's life. And yeah. so yep. I felt this calling to come to Los Angeles, to come to America, to go into the self-help field. And this I was in Ghana? This was in London. Oh, in London. London. Yeah, yeah, H3. You left? We when le you I left Ghana oh, hey, because H3. of a coup. Okay. Yeah, because of a coup. My father was the spiritual teacher, advisor to the president at the time, a guy called Achampong, Ignatius Kutu Achampong. I have his name. Damn. And they killed the president. Rawlings came in, killed the president, started looking for my father. By grace, my father happened to be in London. Wow. And then my mother and I, this Japanese woman in the middle of Africa in the 70s, right. was smuggled out of Ghana, ended up in London. And that took us in a whole different path. So at 18, you know, I'm looking at my future, wondering, wait, wait, I'm feeling my soul calling me in a certain direction. I'm feeling this pull. I'm feeling something, but I have no idea how the hell I'm going to manifest it. Right. No college degree, no money, no father's support. Uh, so I have to tell my father, I'm not taking over. And so I have this conversation with my father. How is that? The African dad, you tell him, tell him right. I'm not following. That's African dad. African dad. I know they pressure. was on you. My dad is the type of guy, well, it's my way. Oh, it's my way. Right. You choose, right. right? And so I sneak up the stairs. I see my father in bed. I am trembling, literally trembling. People think you have to like have no fear to live your dreams. I think it really takes courage to Absolutely. truly manifest and live your dreams. And Absolutely. courage is to feel the fear and move through it and take action anyway, you know? Absolutely. And a lot That's of true. people let fear hijack them. So I tell my father, Dad, I love you, but I'm not taking over. I love you, you and I'm disappointed. My, 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 As a parent, that hurt my heart. My heart sank. I could feel his disappointment. I figured he's gonna like lose it. He said nothing. Silence was even worse. Yeah. And he said, are, are you sure? I said, uh, yeah, I am. Are you <laughs> kind sure? Of, but I don't know. We, we didn't speak for two years. Oh, wow. wow. It was devastating. I went downstairs, broke down in tears because I felt like I had shattered his dreams right. shattered his heart. Um, but I knew that I had to be honest and follow my soul. Absolutely. For your and own happiness. For my own soul, yeah. For my own, for, for, for my own sanity. And so, cut a long story short, I believe that whenever you follow your truth, whenever you follow your soul, whenever you follow your own integrity, life supports you. And so, I ended up winning a green card in the lottery. Wow. The green card lottery. Mm -hmm. That's <laughs> crazy. Yeah. Came, literally, American government gives away 55,000 green cards in the green card lottery. And I came to the US wow. and won this green wow. card. Two suitcases, $1,000, landed in Venice Beach. You by yourself? By myself. No and family you were how here. old then? 19. No family, oh, no wow. friends here? No family, no friends, knew, knew no one. $1,800, no, $1,000 that my mother gave me. And no support, just literally landed in Venice Beach, cried for like a month and then got my shit together, you know? Fo wow. Following my soul. I really believe wow. we have to follow our soul. I, I have found That's throughout nice my thing. life. That's tough. If we follow our soul, I always believe we'll end up in the right place, even though the route we take may not always be what we expect. And so that, that was That's the beginning. Tough. And then I That's went and tough. found, you know, a lot of the authors, the teachers, the mentors, the people I looked up to and knocked on their, literally knocked on their doors, went so, to their houses. So how did your journey start here? in Venice Beach, in LA at 19, because it's not, like people that are not from California, not from LA, you know, know that it's hard and it's, it's expensive hard. to it's live hard. out here. It's you know, it's um, especially as a, a young adult, yeah. just becoming an adult without the approval of your parents. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so how was that journey? Look, it was difficult. You know, sometimes people think that when you follow your purpose, ah, oh, it's easy, life just, you know, all the unicorns come out, the violins, every, it's Not hard. Yeah. I think that sometimes when you follow your true calling and purpose, that's when the challenges begin. That's when the tests begin. A lot of people think that they're on the wrong path because shit hits the fan and life gets difficult. I actually think that that can often be a sign that you're on the right path. Because I think we have to go through these challenges as a test for our soul Absolutely. to develop and sculpt our personalities, to develop the mental, the emotional, the spiritual, strength to be able to fulfill our destiny Absolutely. and so it was difficult i knew no one i cried for like a, a, a month the thing is i you don't feel nothing you like when you have a feeling yeah when you have an emotion or a feeling it's not for any reason like it doesn't just pop up out of nowhere it's no. for a reason it's for a reason and you have to find out what yeah. that reason is for yeah. your own purpose don't yeah. fight the feeling don't exactly. fight don't fight the feeling yeah. see i think 
We all have a dream, and I, I, I feel that our dreams choose us. We think we choose our dreams. I think our dreams choose us because we are the perfect people who are capable of fulfilling those dreams. And everything we have gone through, which may not make sense in the moment, our, our successes, our failures, pains, ups, downs, abuse, divorce, is just part of the, the ingredients that the cosmic chef is using to marinate us and prepare us but it may not make sense in the moment. And I think if we look back, you start seeing, oh, I see why I went through that. I see why that happened. I see why that relationship didn't work out. So um, it was challenging, though. It was challenging. I, cr I literally cried, moved into a tiny uh, 250, 300 square foot apartment studio, pulled a, uh, uh, a bed, a mattress, mm. off of the street that someone threw out. Wow. And I was living my best life. Just happy to be in America. Just happy to be, yeah. Just hap happy to be following your dream. My dream, my right. truth, my integrity on my path. Ain't that you know, and, and so I thought of peace. I thought of peace. I think one of the things as human beings that keeps us stuck, unfulfilled, unhappy are all the ways that we lie to ourselves. Mm -hmm. All the ways that we bullshit ourselves, don't tell the truth to us. We stay in relationships that aren't aligned. We work jobs that we hate. We compromise and betray ourselves in ways and kind of make it rationalize that it's okay. And it kills us inside. It kills mm -hmm. us and inside. It kills us. That and part, so, real shit. And it changes you as a person because yeah. you're not happy with yourself, your yeah. career, your spouse, yeah. or whatever it is. It changes you as a person and you don't recognize yourself yep. because you're trying to be someone else to fulfill certain voids in your life, but you're really just killing yourself slowly. Absolutely. Yes, yeah. you are. I think if people want to really shift, we have to start with telling the truth to ourselves. You know, like, like really asking ourselves, what lies am I telling myself? And really have a deep self-reflection. What lies am I telling myself? What am I pretending to not know? Because mm -hmm. sometimes we play a game of like confusion and pretend like, oh, I'm confused. I don't know. Is this relationship right? When deep down, you know. We know. You yeah. know. We you know, know There's deep no inside. There's no confusion. There's we no know. confusion. confusion. You're making yourself confused. Confusion is the smokescreen or protection mechanism that the ego uses to stay where we are and mm -hmm. keep ourselves safe. Mm -hmm. And so the other thing is, you know, I would invite people to sit with, what is the pain of lying to myself? What is it costing me? Because there is a cost, and that cost is pain. It's painful. When we lie to ourselves, it should be painful. It should hurt. It's a simply a sign that we're not alive. And so I had to start asking myself all the questions of, as a kid as to, wow, I'm not living in alignment here. You know? and, and it was very painful. So coming to the US as challenging as it was, I was happy. I was, living, you know, I was literally working, you know, scrounging food from, from supermarkets. I was working in a dollar a, a dish Chinese restaurant just washing dishes. But I was following my path. And that was beautiful. You know, I started doing multi-level marketing. And through that, I met people, met some of my teachers, met some of my mentors, knocked on their doors, knocked on their houses, on their offices, and just You're said, hey, hustling. You're I hustling. want to learn you from you guys. Your dream. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And so that began my path. You know, and I began promoting seminars of some of my inspirations. And one thing led to the next. And the real shift happened when I was promoting a seminar for, like I think it was Les Brown, a motivational speaker. And one of the, the sales managers said, We've seen Les like 50 times, you know. We kind of like you, do you speak? And I was like, absolutely. And so that, that began my speaking career and one thing led yeah, to the you next. you speak very well yeah, very and well. definitely inspiring to, to grow and follow your dreams and, yeah. and what you want as far as what your soul wants and not what you think you want. Yeah. So that, that's that amazing. part to that, real shit, man. You you got a whole story behind you, like a Wakanda movie, real shit. <laughs> Pass the torch to my son. My son don't want it. He gonna do something different. He succeeds. Shit, that he right succeeds there. Succeeds with the passion it. behind yeah, it. That's yeah. important. I feel like there's a lot of successful people that are successful but not genuinely happy. They're not happy. Yeah. And it, it it becomes a job, and it doesn't become a passion. You know, I feel like you don't go to work every day and 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 there's a lot of people that go to work every day that are miserable you yeah. know that aren't happy that fight themselves and fight the people around them because they're not happy with where they're at with their work and they just do work to make money but then at the same time if you find the passion behind what you like to do it doesn't become a job yeah it mm -hmm. becomes a passion like I'm passionate about about what I do and the upside the bonus is the funds yeah, you know absolutely so I think that 
I'm like at a loss for words. That's uh, amazing. Living uh, your purpose, right? I, absolutely. I think without purpose, work is just kind of meaningless. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. And I think life is about really finding your purpose and sharing one's gift, that we all have a gift, and to find that and share that with the world is, is true fulfillment. It's true. To me, that is true success. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So let's talk about these books. Yeah. You are the one. You are the one. That you was are my the first one. book. So the first book. That was my first How book. long did it take you Ooh. to write this book? Ooh, my whole life. Ooh. This book took me my entire life to write because it was the accumulation of my entire life experiences in a simplified form in a book. And here's the thing. I wrote probably eight versions of this book, submitted a final version to Simon & Schuster, the publisher, they bought it. And then three months before publication, they started making some changes and the book that ended up being here was a completely different book than I actually thought was gonna happen. Oh, wow. so, so I had to rewrite the book in three months. And so it took me my whole life to write, literally, literally that's what I would say. But, but I sat down and began writing many iterations of the book throughout the years. And then the final one was literally in three months. And I hate writing. Oh, hate writing. I hate <laughs> writing. <laughs> but did you have someone like you wrote it yourself or did you have some like you were speaking? Because yeah. I've always thought about like my journey and my story is yeah. still to be written. It's still continuing. But I have an interesting story. Not I wouldn't say as interesting as yours yeah. and as interesting as the path that you've taken. But I like if I was to write a book, I would just literally just talk and let That's someone write you That's know like because i just how i speak and how i how people read and write like i want to i want them to feel what yeah. i'm saying as yeah. opposed to just me speaking it, it how i speak isn't yeah. like how you speak. You, you you have yeah. to find your own unique way of expressing and so for the longest time i tried to make myself be the kind of writer I thought I needed to be based on what other people were. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't flowing. So I would sit down and punish myself and make myself sit there and type. And it was literally, it was suffering. And so like you, I realized I'm a speaker. Mm -hmm. So what I began doing was I said, well, how can I honor my unique flow? How can I honor my unique personality? And I began recording. Mm -hmm. And I just began just spewing out a whole bunch of information, captured it. Then I went and edited it. Then I got an editor to help me. Yeah. You know? But I think one of the keys to writing that I realized for myself was because many times I think we get caught in a perfectionistic tendency yes. to write something amazing and then nothing comes out. Yeah. And then nothing, <laughs> let's like talk about writer's block. For me, what I realized is give yourself permission to be, to be crap. Mm -hmm. Give yourself permission to completely suck and just dump the information out. You will be amazed that when you let things flow, stuff starts coming out that yeah. you didn't even know was in there. And that's how I began writing. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. So your whole life. The so first now, one was my I whole life. I can't wait to read this. Sure. I cannot wait. I can't wait. It's I'm got so stories excited. of how my parents met. It's got stories. I mean, so many different stories. I have, I am so I have a question about this book. Oh, this book this is book a, right another here. monster. The, the Magic of one. Surrender right this here. This came out. Yes, this is a new one surrender. right here that he has out. And I was reading off the first I tab right here. After the passing of Coot Blackson's mother yeah. in this, uh, 2017, he discovered the powerful lesson in his mother and pretty much has been modeling his whole life. How was the loss of your mother? Like, dive into that, because that's such yeah, a deep. deep thing that a lot of people go through, losing a parent, it's losing deep. somebody that's their backbone. How was that? How did you go through it that? It was very intense. You know, I was promoting my first book, and I'm on a high. I get a phone call that my mother is, has stomach cancer. Mm. And it was, you know, she was a love of my life. And I'm her only son, ch wow. only child. Yeah. It was just me and her growing up, you know? And so it was brutal. It was, so I started to fly from LA to London every month for five days to be with her during wow. her chemo. And it was challenging, but it ended up honestly being the best year of my entire life. <laughs>